may be seated. The fascination of not a few of us with the right hand of God is not unfounded, what with scores of scriptures making their individual strokes, there is an unmistakable image that emerges illustrating, I think convincingly, that the right hand of God is a particular and a powerful biblical meaning. Not as a physical location, to be sure, God, the scripture says, being the one who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light that no man can approach the Bible no man hath seen nor can see. Paul thundered to us that God is the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, and ascribes to him honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. But while not physically specific, the right hand of God is nonetheless specific by definition. When Ephesians chapter 1 sits Jesus at God's right hand in the heavenlies, it is to say that he is far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And all things are under his feet and he is ahead of all things. In Mark 16, he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. In Acts 2, he is by the right hand of God exalted. In Romans 8, he is risen again and at the right hand of God maketh intercession for us. In 1 Peter 3, he has gone into heaven on God's right hand. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. In Matthew 26, Jesus himself said, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power. And after Stephen's message had knifed its way through to the seared souls of his hearers, the Bible said they were cut to the heart and gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, lifted up his eyes and looked steadfastly and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God but it's it's a truth of two testaments not just one it stands astride the old and the new thy right hand O Lord has become glorious in power said Exodus 15 and his right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory Psalm 98 and the Bible said his right hand has spanned the heavens. And Isaiah 48 and 14 chapters later, the Lord swore by his right hand. Israel took Canaan by the Lord's right hand, according to Psalm 44. And when David was remembering the miraculous past, he said he would remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. Psalm 77 and Psalm 1611 says that there are pleasures forevermore at the Lord's right hand. In 138, he saves us. In 139, he holds us. And from the day that Isaac cunningly crossed his hands over the head of Joseph's sons until the redeemed stand at the right hand of the Lord in eternity from the Genesis to the Revelation and virtually every book in between the right hand of God, it merits mention. It is might and it is majesty and it is grace and it is glory. It is strength, it is supply, it is pomp, it is power, it is preeminence, it is all there at the Lord's right hand. 
They put John's body on the Isle of Patmos, but his spirit went to paradise. And he said, I was in the spirit of the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the foot, girt about the paps, with a golden girdle, his head and his hair were white like wool. His eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet were as fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. His voice as the sound of many waters, and he held in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he came, and he laid his right hand upon me, and said, Fear not, for I am he that liveth, and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, and have the king to death and to hell I stand tonight to tell you that the Lord's right hand is power, it's pomp it's preeminence, it's glory it's grace, it's strength, it's supply it's might, it's majesty but more than likely that's not the side of God that you'll first see. When he was bent to the breaking point, Job caustically cried. He hid it himself on the right hand. It may be power. It may be glory and strength. But Job said, that God hides himself on the right hand. But even while he was stumbling through the dark corridor of his crisis, he lit a torch of hope for every man and for every woman that's in this audience tonight. What out of the chasm of his own trial, eerily echoing out of the depths of his own despair, one of the Bible's most benevolent promises, hallelujah, came from the lips of Job as he fought to preserve his own fragile faith. There was a truth that elbowed its way out. He said, behold, I go forward and he is not there and backward, but I cannot perceive him on the left hand where he doth work. I rise tonight to tell you that God may dwell on the right hand in glory and in power, but he is obliged to work on the left hand in my weakness and in my need. And I'm here to tell somebody tonight that God is in this house to work for us on the left hand. The right hand gets all the ink. But not infrequently. I can't find him there. So the Hebrew writer said, We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities or our weaknesses but was in all points tempted like as we are. He dwells on the right hand in that blinding light that no man can approach in power but precious preachers and precious preachers wives. He is pleased to work on the left hand in my weakness and in my need when I'm tired and when I'm tempted when I'm confused and when I'm confounded when I'm wayward and when I'm weary God doesn't back up God doesn't bow out God doesn't run for cover he just steps in to my situation and says I dwell on the right hand but bless God I work He could have picked any people on the planet for his own. 
And he fixed his focus on the most feeble one of all. And Ezekiel looked at Israel and reminded them of their origin. He said, thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. You're a half-breed. He said, your father's an Amorite and your mother's a Hittite. And as for thy nativity, in the day when thou wast born, thy cord was not cut, neither wast thou washed with water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all. Thou wast not swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee. Nobody had compassion on you, but you were cast out into the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day when thou wast created. But he said, when I passed by thee and saw thee lying, polluted, in thine own blood when I saw thee in thy blood I said live I saw thee lying in thy own blood and he said to Israel I said live what was he telling them I didn't choose you Israel because you're strong I chose you because I'm strong hallelujah and I'm a God that is so mighty and is so great and is so majestic that I can afford to work on the left hand in your weakness hallelujah I know whereof I speak I'm preaching to preachers who slipped into because of the times you came here with a halting step you're unsure you're uncertain the devil has us questioning our calling our ministry our power our effectiveness I rise tonight to tell you that God is a God who is pleased to work in our weakness For seven years, Midian was a menace to Israel. They were like grasshoppers for number, ravaging their crops, savaging the people, destroying their increase, poisoning the wells, devouring the land, impoverishing that entire nation. And they lived their lives cowering under the crushing heel of Midian's indomitable forces, burrowing themselves in caves and dens and clefts of the rock. And so God sends an angel to opera. And he sends this angel to a fella who's stretching wheat behind a wine press, hiding it from the Midianites to spare it. And God says to this angel he is dispatching, that when you go to Gideon, the son of Joash, I want you to treat him with respect. Because in three weeks, he's going to take 300 bugle blowers and wipe out the world's greatest war machine. And there's more to him than meets the eye. So the angel comes to Gideon, and he says, Ha! How mighty man of valor. Gideon ducks behind the wine press and chuckles. Politely explains to the angel why it's not wise for him to go and attack the army of Midian. He said, let me get this clear for you. I'm the least in my family. It's the least in the tribe. The tribe's the least in the nation. And the nation ain't much to talk about either. <laughs> Say weakness. Say weakness. Say weakness. Gideon gives that long litany of why he can't. And when he finishes, God slaps his knee and bounds from his throne. He knows he's found this man. And the angel looks at Gideon and said, Now go in this thy might. So after God had cut his crew down to size, a lean, mean 300, he hears the fearful whining doleful tones of Gideon and he realizes that Gideon is afraid and so God comes to him and he says now I've heard what you're saying now I want you to go hear what your enemy is saying and so he creeps down into the camp of the Midianites and they're spread across the valley and they're like grasshoppers from multitude and camels without number and he gets up next to the tent flap 
and he's sitting there with his servant and he hears this Midianite in his foreign but understandable tongue begin to describe a dream where a cake of barley came rolling down out of a mountain and it smoked the tent and the tent fell and there was great destruction that was wreaked in their camp and Gideon is listening raptly to this dream. And as soon as the fella finishes telling the dream, another voice is heard. And unequivocally, this voice says, It's nothing save the sword of Gideon, for God hath delivered Midian and the host into his hand. And Gideon said, Let's back that film up one more time on it. He said, Have they know who I was? I'm just a stupid little kid that 48 hours ago was threshing wheat behind the wine press and some angel with his brain out of orbit came and told me that I was going to wipe out the Midianite army. I tried to explain to him all the weaknesses that would preclude me from being able to do this mighty work for God. And he told me that my weakness was my strength. Hallelujah. That my inadequacy was my might. Hallelujah. And now I'm listening to some cat that's having a dream and his buddy is telling him that I have had the army of Midian delivered into my hand. You know what he did? The Bible said the first thing he did was he worshiped. And if you ever get down into the devil's camp and hear how frightful, how afraid the devil is when God starts working in our weakness, Let me tell you something. Gideon was so emboldened that he went back and he didn't have but 300. And he said, let's split up. And he put a few over here and a few over there and a few over there. He said, we don't have to stick together. We're going to wipe them out. They don't have a chance. I'm coming to tell you in the Holy Ghost tonight that there are some people in this audience Hallelujah. And God wants us, I've been included in your number, to understand that we can catalog our weaknesses. We can catalog our weaknesses. We can list a long litany of things that work against us. But I've rise to tell you that the God who dwells on the right hand is obliged to work on the left hand. God doesn't need your strength. God doesn't need your potential. God doesn't need your ability. God doesn't need your talent. God is pleased to work on the left hand. I want everybody to take your left hand and thrust it in the air. We need to wise up. We have listened to our own whining, doleful voices long enough. We need to take a break and creep into the camp of our adversary and hear what he's saying. I don't think the devil is as bold and I don't think the devil is as brilliant as we think he is. If you creep up on the devil's camp, I'll tell you what he knows. Upon this rock, God shall build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. knows that he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. The devil knows that when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. He knows that. See, I don't feel tough like some of you probably do. I don't feel gifted and talented and on top of my game. 
so I've got to have a God who'll work on the left hand. Now some of you may have found him on the right hand, but he's hiding himself on that side to me. And so if I can't find one that works on the left hand, then I'm left out in the cold. But Job has lit my torch of hope when he said on the left hand where he doth work. Hallelujah. That means I can get up in the morning with a little bit of fear and trepidation in my soul. It means I can walk to a pulpit not feeling like I have all the answers. It means that I can lay my hand on a sick man's head not really sure if it's going to work or not. It means that I don't have to walk through day after day feeling like that I've got all the pieces to the puzzle. But I've got a God. <laughs> I've got a God who dwells on the right hand. But that same God is pleased to work on the left hand. i tell you what that does. That promises revival and power to every man and woman in this house tonight because God is willing to work in our weakness. sat on an Acropolis on a broad fertile plain about 15 miles inland from the Aegean Sea Pergamos Turkish town of Bergamo is there now came to fame under Alexander the Great 133 years before Jesus came it was bequeathed to the Romans became a capital city it was home to one of the most stupendous libraries of antiquity 200,000 books in a day when they had to be hand transcribed parchments the animal skins that were used for paper had begun in Pergamos. But it was more well known for the fact that it was the seat of worship of four pagan deities. Magnificent temples dotted the landscape to Athena, Dionysius, Asclepius, and Zeus. Hallelujah. It was a center of that blasphemous worship of Caesar because as a territorial capital in the Roman Empire, it was the county seat where the worship of the ruler Caesar was carried on. Jutting out from the Acropolis upon which it sat was a 90-foot square ledge, 40 feet high, an ancient wonder of architecture. In the 19th century, the Germans went and excavated it and took it to a... Berlin Museum to keep and leave on display. It was the altar of Zeus. That's why when John wrote to the Christians at Pergamos, he said to them, I know where you dwell. You dwell where Satan's seat is. You live in a place not where just Satan lives, but Satan has a throne. He has a seat. He's in control. But he said, thank God, I want to commend you that right on the devil's doorstep, you have kept the faith and you have not denied his name and you have built a church hallelujah right under the devil's nose when Balak wanted to curse Israel he went and got Balaam hired him brought him to a mountain and he said now look here's what we're going to do this is the plan we're going to go back over here to the hinder part of the camp where the slow walkers are I want you to curse this people from the utmost part of the camp. So they killed a few rams and Balaam went and talked to God and came back down and opened his mouth to prophesy. And Balak, like they had a coronary, when old Balaam said, how shall I curse whom the Lord hath not cursed? And how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? Hallelujah. For from the top of the rocks I see him. And from the hills I behold him. And the people shall dwell alone. And shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob? Or number the fourth part of Israel? Let me tie the death of the righteous. And let my last hand be like his. And Balak says, shut up. Let's go further back. Where the weak of the weak are. 
they killed a few more cows. And he prophesied again. And he said, God's not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said it? And will he not do it? Hath he spoken it? Will he not bring it to pass? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither have I seen perverseness in Israel. But the Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among him. And surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither divination against Israel. But from this time forward it shall be said, What hath God wrought? And the people shall rise up like a great lion. What are you saying, Brother Williams? I'm telling you this. No matter how strong the devil gets, and no matter how weak I get, God's word and God's work is still going to be carried out it will not be controverted his plan will not be interdicted because we have a God hallelujah who works in our weakness see I've been here every year and you feel pretty tough while you're here. But in about three weeks, you're going to wake up one morning and feel like your teeth have been kicked down your throat. And there's not going to be any because of the time wave breaking over your head. And that's when you're going to remember what old Willie baby preached. That God may dwell on the right hand but he works on the left hand he works in my weakness he doesn't back up he doesn't bow out he doesn't run for cover when he looks at me and I've got the white flag tied on the pole and I'm fixing a toss in the towel God runs to my rescue hallelujah 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 and he said hey wait a minute I don't just work with the strong and the gifted and the talented I work in weakness When Israel went clamoring for Israel went clamoring for a king, God went looking for potential. This is the other side of the coin. God went looking for potential. He went and found him a guy, a Benjamite, Saul, the son of Kish, head and shoulders above all the people, regal bearing, cunning mind. Israel said, and God said, I'll get you a kingly king. For the next 40 years, creator and creature fought at every turn in the road. He resisted God repeatedly, steadfastly. He jumped the gun at Gilgal and offered sacrifice. In Samuel's stead, he spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the cattle and the oxen and the rams. He hounded David like a dog over mountain and meadow. He banished the witches and then went and cowered in one's cave at Endor. Until the last with his three sons by his side, he was slain and beheaded and stripped of his armor and his body hanged on the wall of Bethshan. And when God walked away from the grave of Saul, he wiped his hands clean and said, Never again! And so the next time that Samuel grabbed up his horn of oil and went to find Israel another king. Eliab came walking in front of him. And Samuel jumped up, took his horn of oil, and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me, and went to anoint Eliab. And God said, Hold it! Look not on his stature, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. And Abinadab came by, and Samuel jumped up, and God said, Back up, Baba. And Shammah came by, and Samuel started to anoint him, and God said, Wait! And seven sons passed by. Samuel looked at Jesse, and he said, Are these all the children? Jesse. 
He said, no. I said, there's one more, but he's not the one. He's young. Go ahead and exhale. It's all right. He, he, he's a sheep keeper. He's not the guy you're looking for. But old ruddy David came crashing through the door. And the Lord hit Samuel like a thunderclap. And he said, arise and anoint him. For this is he. And the rules of the road had just changed. Weakness is going to confound strength. Hallelujah. And the foolish is going to confound the wise. And the God, hallelujah, that we serve doesn't have to have potential and ability and gifts and talent and money and strength and power. Ah, he can take you. He can take me. And he can do a magnificent and miraculous work because he dwells on the right hand, but he works. Trust your left hand and shout yes. Next time, the next time God chose that kind of strength was a full testament away. It was another Saul, another Benjamite, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. Hebrew of the Hebrews, touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, church and the law, blameless. But this Saul did not see his accomplishments as currency. This Saul did not see his strength as being very important. And he said, but what things were gain to me, I counted a loss for Christ. And he knew much, but he said, I've determined to know nothing save Christ and him crucified. And his accomplishments were great. But he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do with them. Forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And he faced down the Corinthian Christians and he said, I came to you. I came to you. And what? That's a wimpy weakness. I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. But he said, I'm not worried about it because the body behind that blinding light that drove me to the ground on the Damascus Highway, he said his grace was sufficient for me and that his strength was made perfect in my weakness. The right hand of God is just raw, naked power. But when it stands alone, it's incomplete. It's like a lyric without a melody. It's like a poem without a punchline. It's like a book without an ending. But when His strength finds my weakness, it finds its own perfection. said his strength is made perfect in my weakness it's just naked power it's just like a fire out of control it's just raw hallelujah but when his strength finds my weakness and when his power finds my frailty his strength finds its own perfection You may have stumbled into because of the times reeling from the unrelenting blows of our out of orbit world drowned in despair down for the nine count feeling like you were a hostage to unrealized hopes but I want to challenge you not to raise the white flag just yet I'm not crazy what do you think it's like having your best friend have all this
You want your best friend to have 50. <laughs> so that you don't daily get a diet of intimidation. Not easy having that for your best buddy. Does that make sense? Huh? You can never win. No matter what you do. Never hits the line. Never reaches the mark. I know how you feel when you walk in here. You're surrounded by thousands. You're serenaded by a choir without parallel. And you see success from every side. And it's possible to walk out of this place and feel like that God is only going home with the guy that's got the manor and the ministry. Just listen to me. And the money. But old Williams is coming tonight to tell you that when the light, just listen, that when the lights go out in here tonight and we all say our goodbyes, God's going to get in the car with the guy that's got the inadequate facility and the anemic bank account and the lethargic leaders and the outreach programs that don't work. I want you to understand that God's not just leaving this place with the guy that's got it all together, but he works on the left hand. He's going to crawl on that airplane with all of us in our weakness because God is pleased to work on the left hand. Shout yes! Shout yes! Shout yes! We're all going to have revival. We're all going to have power because God is a God who works in weakness. to us, Jesus. Jehoshaphat was surrounded by Moab, Ammon, the children of Mount Seir. It was a death sentence. The Bible said he feared. That was an appropriate response. Set himself to seek the Lord, proclaimed to fast. He was desperate. That's what we do when we're desperate. He gathered everybody together, went to church. And then here's what he did. He reminded God who God was. He said, kind of brashly, Art not thou he as the God in heaven rulest thou not over all the kingdoms of the heathen in thy hand? Is there not power and might? Are you not the one of whom it was said that no man can stand before you? God didn't say anything. So he figured he'd change his tactic and tell him what was going on. He said, Behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir have come against us to cast us out of that possession. God still didn't say anything. Just let him twist at the end of the rope. And he's told God who he is. And he's told him what's going on. And there's no help in sight. But then he hit the hot button. He said, we have no might against this great company. And neither know we what to do. But our eyes are upon 
on thee. And God said, why didn't you say so? said don't be afraid and don't be dismayed the Bible the battle is not yours Jehoshaphat said you sure could have fooled me I really felt like I was standing out here and they were coming after me I don't know why I felt that way but I really felt like the battle was mine God said no it's not yours he said just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord and the singers sang and the praisers praised and angels ambushed the Moabites and the Ammonites and the children of Mount Seir and it took Jehoshaphat three days just to pick up the loot you see that God made the Son is not hard for us to believe. We don't have any trouble believing that. 864,000 miles in diameter. Two billion, billion, billion tons of gas and every square inch of it compressed by one million, million pounds of pressure. So much energy flooding the inside that its internal temperature is 25 million degrees Fahrenheit. It consumes 657 million tons of hydrogen every second. And I don't care what the naturalists say, the sun can go on burning for 50 billion more years. The moon. Controls the tides from a quarter million miles away. Absorbs the sun's light. Stores it. Sheds it full. We don't have any trouble at all believing the psalmist when he said the sun to rule by day and the moon to rule by night. But what we don't believe is this. Whirling all about the sun and the moon. There are billions of nameless stars out there in deep space. And because the Bible knows how we think on the very first page of the very first book, the writer said, He made the stars also. As it is with the heavens, so it is with the humans. Sacred and secular, ancient and contemporary history is filled with charismatic characters that leap off the pages of our books and they command our attention, their courage, their cowardice, their faithfulness, their failures, their righteousness, their wrong, they're larger than life. And if I am not careful, my adversary neutralizes me because in my mind he minimizes my importance and my power and my value and my contribution contribution to the kingdom it's a sinister trick of Satan and we ought to debunk it in this house tonight and banish it forever hallelujah God may dwell on the right hand in power but he works on the left hand in weakness enshrined in Hebrews Hall of Fame, there's this pantheon of imperfect people. And you read their holy heroics, and if you're not careful, you forget that Noah got intoxicated. And Abraham deceived Ahimelech, and Sarah doubted God. It's easy to forget that Jacob swindled Esau and that Moses was a murderer and that Rahab was a harlot and that Gideon bowed down and worshipped an ephod and Samson consorted with wicked men and David was an adulterer but they subdued kingdoms and wrought righteousness and obtained promises and stopped the mouths of lions. Hallelujah. They escaped the violence of fire. They escaped the sword. They waxed pallion in flight. They turned to fight the armies of the aliens they were weak they were weak but out of weakness they were made strong one of the 
devil's most dastardly deceptions is that he can make you and me feel accidental and incidental to the work of God. There's a group of people in this room, you don't have to worry about them. They're going to make it. But the ones I've come to preach to are the ones that walk out of here tonight with a question mark in their head and a little bit of uncertainty in their step and a little halting in their way. I want that guy to fly out of this building when I get through tonight with his head held high and his arm in the air telling himself, God, it's not impeded. God, it's not put off. God, it's not frightened by my weakness, by my weakness, by my weakness. But he is pleased, thank God, to work. Psalmist said, Thou hast searched me, O Lord, and known me. I know it's my down sitting, my uprising, understand it's my thought of far off. Thou come passeth my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word in my tongue, but lo, Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. I'm not accidental. I am fearfully and wonderfully made and marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect and in thy book all my members were written which in continuance were fashioned when there were none of them. I'm not accidental. Jeremiah had this little whiny look on his face and God looked at him and he said before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee before thou camest forth out of the womb I sanctified thee and I ordained thee and then Jeremiah started talking he said ah Lord God I can't and I'm as a child. And God said, Say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces. For I am with thee. See, this day I have set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root up and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant. Behold, this day I have made thee a defense city and iron pillars and brazen walls against the whole earth and they shall fight against thee but they shall not prevail because I am with thee to deliver thee saith the Lord some of us live on a different street but there are those of us who sometimes feel like that we're down to nothing. And we find consolation in the fact that when we're down to nothing, God's up to something. Abraham broke camp took his three-day trek across the trackless desert when he got to Moriah he separated himself from his son's servants and he began that torturous climb up the face of that mountain his hopes and dreams were bound up in the body of Isaac that was walking beside him balancing in his hand a little bundle of sticks for fire a cord to bind the sacrifice to the altar the makings of an altar on his back and of a fire decades of travel decades of trial had been distilled into one last miserable moment he's ready to surrender his hopes and watch him go up in smoke he is stripped he is down to nothing but when I get there God is up to something because he dwells on the right hand and power but he is pleased to work on the left hand in my weakness
And as Abraham took every tortured step of the face of Moriah, unbeknownst to him, there was a ram picking its way through thistles and briars, hot footing his way up the other side of the mountain trying to beat Isaac to Abraham's altar. Hallelujah. Because when I'm down and stripped and have nothing left and feel weak, God is pleased to step in and to work for me on the left hand. I want you to understand tonight that my spiritual and my emotional and my physical bankruptcy does not scare God. The God with whom I have to do took four emaciated lepers, invaded a Syrian camp and wiped it out and spared Samaria. This God took Samson who was bound and blinded and belittled and touched him one last time and destroyed more in his death than he had in his life. This God snatched Elisha from behind a team of oxen in the field of Abel Mahala and bypassed a mountain full of men and seized his soul and gave him Elijah's mantle of power and his ministry of miracle. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. He dwells on the right hand of the works. Israel and Philistia were faced off in Gibeon. They were not eager to engage the enemy and so Saul was under a pomegranate tree in Migron far from the fray. And the armies were drinking that deadly poison of delay and they were becoming antsy and something happened in the soul of Jonathan and he sensed that God was near and was ready to work even in his weakness. The 600 men that Saul had were no match for the might and the forces of Philistia. They were paralyzed with fright. And so Jonathan says to his servant, it matters not to God to save by many or to save by few. Let's go show ourselves to the Philistines and see what they say per adventure that God will work for us. So they crawl through the perilous pass over jagged rocks. They show themselves to the Philistines. And the Philistines raise up and boldly challenge Jonathan. And they say, come up and we'll show you a thing or two. And Jonathan doesn't even have a sword in his hand. He turns to his armor bearer and he said, let's go because God has delivered them into our hand. And as he enters the valley, the Philistines begin to fall before him. And his armor bearer comes behind him, slaying him. And the Bible said the earth trembled and that the surviving forces of Philistia took to fleeing. And they were beating one another down as they went. And the Bible said that that was the first slaughter. Everybody say the first slaughter. You know how many dead people there were? Twenty. There's twenty dead people, Brother Tenny. And the Bible called it a slaughter. They were discomfited. They were fleeing. They were beating each other down. But the war wasn't over. The battle had just been joined. And the first conflict won. And the Bible calls it the first slaughter. Now Saul is sitting back over here on the side. He's out of it. He hears all this tumult. And he decides he ought to pray. Because not a single sword has been unsheathed. Not one spear has been flung. Not one arrow has been shot. And his enemy's running. And it's bugging him. Because he's Mr. Potential. And he's not comfortable with a God who works in weakness. And so he calls for the ephod and he starts to pray but there's too much going down. And he, he, he just slams the book shut and hands the ephod to the priest. And he says, I can't, I can't pray now. 
I'm going to have to join the flight and chase the Philistines. And so he goes running after them. And the Bible says that all the Israelites who had left Israel and joined themselves to the Philistines when they saw that God was at work for Israel, they returned and fought with their people. And those that were living in the dens and the caves and the clefts of the rock, they came back and fought for Israel. And as they came to a place called Beth Haven, the Bible said that they came to a forest and there was honey on the ground. And Saul, so insensitive, so unaware of what God's doing, he commands his famished soldiers not to eat until they have pursued and finished prosecuting the battle to the end. But Jonathan, who had jeoparded his life, who had seen the mighty hand of God, had worked up an appetite. And he didn't hear what his father said. And so he stuck his staff in the honey and began to eat it. And the Bible said that his eyes were enlightened and his strength was renewed. Hallelujah. And he went on his way pursuing the Philistines. But Saul was so obsessed with what he perceived to be the final solution that he failed to pause long enough to savor and to enjoy and to revel in the victory that God had already wrought. I want to stop and say tonight that God has worked in our weakness for us already and we're not there yet and we haven't apprehended yet and we haven't attained yet but we have had some victories and God wants us to stop and take time to rejoice and taste the honey of victory. You know what happened? Saul pushed his men to chase the Philistines. And they found them, and they fought them, and they defeated them. But the Bible said they were so faint by the time they finished prosecuting the battle that they slew the animals and ate the blood and violated Leviticus 7 and transgressed against the law of God because they were so weary. There's some of us, and we're still in the fight, and we're still pushing. Hallelujah. But we're weary. We've lost our sense of pleasure. And the Holy Ghost has brought us to Alexandria for 48 hours to put our staff in the honey and to enjoy the taste of victory that God has given us so far. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you came from. I don't care what your ministry is. Everybody in this house has experienced a measure of victory and success even in your weakness. And God wants us in Alexandria to stop and to refresh, to revel, to sever, to enjoy what he has done for us. Give me a moment more. God telegraphed a message to us. On the first page of the Bible. When he spoke worlds into creation. He knew everything he was going to do from the day he started. And he could have spoken them all into being with one word. But he did it in stages. First day there was light. And he stopped. And he enjoyed it. Second day. He divided the firmament and the waters. And he stopped. And he enjoyed it. Got up one day and he said. I don't have any seas. Don't have any bees. Don't have any trees. 
There's not a galaxy over my head. There's no grass beneath my feet. There's not a rattlesnake in the woods and a river running through the mountains. But I got light and I got firmament. Bless God, and I think I'll stop and enjoy it. And the Holy Ghost is wanting to send a message to every man and woman in this house. We haven't got everything we want yet. We haven't realized all of our spiritual aspirations. We haven't seen all of our dreams come true. There are still some empty benches. And there are still some altars not yet full enough. And there are still some things that have not come to fruition in our ministry. And there's something that gets in us. And we just keep pushing. And we just keep driving. And we keep so fixated on the final goal and the ultimate achievement that sometimes we grow weary and faint in the fight because God wants us to take the time to stop and enjoy the victories that he has wrought even in our weakness he wants us to stop and take time to taste the honey Samson fought a lion and tore him limb for limb with his bare hands. When he got finished, he wiped his hands and walked away. When he came back, there was honey in the carcass of the lion because God wasn't finished with that situation yet. And the Holy Ghost wants me and you to acknowledge the fact that even in our weakness God has worked on the left hand God has worked. And He wants us to take the time before we walk out of this sanctuary tonight to savor, to revel in, to rejoice, to give thanks for, to enjoy every victory that God has wrought. You heard Billy Cole said on this platform the other day, and he said this. He said, the more God uses me, the more I suffer and the higher price I pay in my own body. I've got the answer, pal. He works in weakness. He tries. He dwells on the right hand in power. But he is pleased to work on the left hand in our weakness. And I'm saying to somebody in this house tonight, that when you walk out of here, don't think that God is just going home with the guy that's got all the pieces to the puzzle. But God is going to leave here tonight. Stand to your feet. Thank you, Jesus. I gave myself 
myself without reservation, myself without self-esteem, without my own to be wanted and to be lifted up. I gave myself, I gave myself in weakness that the strength of that weakness could be born in you, that you could know me, love me, cherish me, and allow my strength to embrace you when you stand in times of wonder, of concern, without answers, because I am your answer. Let's raise our hands and voices. Come on, let's do it with energy. Let's do it with energy. Come on, let's do it with energy. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us. Come on, let's pray to God. here tonight he is obliged to work raise your hands and praise the Lord take the chairs out please don't anyone leave preachers give me five minutes of your time raise your hands and praise the Lord would you do that chairs quickly men and women move with your chairs